So motion sickness is uh, is a very prevalent uh, condition, which and I guess a lot of us have suffered from this at one point or the other. Uh, it is not a disease in the right term. Okay, it's just a it's a kind of sickness. It's a it's a body response. It's a phys uh, it's what we call the physiological vertigo. And it is just a normal response when a, when a healthy individual is subjected to a, an unfamiliar or an unexpected or unhabituated uh, kind of movement. And if anyone is uh, provoked with such a movement, which is very severe and, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's prolonged, you expect that the person should get some amount of motion sickness. And if, he, and if a person doesn't... Uh, get any of these, uh, the absence of any of these symptoms uh, would suggest that something is abnormal in, in that person. Uh, and what are the signs and symptoms of this uh, motion sickness? The first prerequisite uh, of motion sickness is uh, to have a functional labyrinth. Uh, if the labyrinth is not functional, he'll be totally immune to this uh, condition. You would get generally nausea, vomiting, Pala, cold sweating, excessive uh, salivation. But you also have these other associated symptoms like uh, yawning, hyperventilation, anxiety, headache, flatulence, and drowsiness. Uh, drowsiness is often neglected uh, symptom. Sometimes you can have uh, only drowsiness as a, as a symptom of, um, of motion sickness, and it would last for a slightly a longer period of time following the uh, cessation of the uh, provoking uh, stimulus. What are the theories behind motion sickness? Uh, motion sickness as such does not have any other purpose except it's a, it's a normal response. Uh, how did this, uh, there, there was a, uh, there's a postulation that is a poison uh, response. Now what's this poison response? Uh, in the early days of uh, evolution of human being, we didn't have any other mode of locomotion, right? Except for what God has given us, the two feet. All we do is just walk. And by walking, it would not stimulate us any motion sickness. But we did eat a lot, all right? So when we eat a lot, uh, uh, we may eat something which is not good for us. And uh, in the tummy, they would produce a neurotoxin. And these neurotoxin would stimulate the brain. Uh, these are unhabituated or rather unfamiliar to the brain. So it produces a kind of a mismatch. And what does the, what does the brain order the, the, the stomach to do? To vomit it out. Okay, so that condition has remained, that, that, that has preconditioned a brain to identify that anything that is unfamiliar, that is uh, unexpected, unhabituated, it detects as a, as a toxin to the body. So it, it directs the stomach to vomit it out. So that's how the uh, poison response uh, hypothesis came out. And the other uh, hypothesis is that it's an el eliciting or a reinforcing stimulus for conditioned avoidance of potentially da dangerous situation. But over the years, the most uh, accepted theory is a uh, neural mismatch theory, which was proposed by Reason and Brandt in 1979-75. Uh, now, what is the basis of this, uh, of this theory is that uh, you get motion sickness when you have an unexpected or unlearned correlation. Okay, there's an unlearned correlation which is happening in the brain, uh, which uh, when, when you have these sensory inputs coming from, the, from your eyes, your ears, and your proprioceptors. So these are all unexpected. They, they are not correlating with each other. And so it, uh, you develop a mismatch. Now what's happening in, in, uh, within the central nervous system? The central nervous system is just like, uh, okay, this is in, in general explanation that in, uh, it acts, there's a, within the central nervous system, there is a memory, memory bank, okay? And this memory bank, it, it links to different uh, uh, coordinators or, or uh, you have a comparators, okay? So you, you get a signal, it sends to these comparators where these uh, signals that is coming from your sensory inputs and you have a neural store, okay, which is already stored from your previous experience. So these, uh, these inputs are correlated with these uh, stored information and they are sent back to the bank and see that, okay, there's a mismatch. Or if, if there's no mismatch, you have no symptom, but if there's mismatch, it, in the in the, it, uh, it manifests itself as a motion sickness. Now, you have uh, 
two kinds of uh, phenomena which is happening when there's a, when when the brain identifies a mismatch. When there's a mismatch, either it can produce uh, motion sickness or it can the the signals gets modulated or modified, and the brain uh, stores that information. Okay, stores a new input pattern so that in future, if if a similar kind of pattern that can be identified as a normal for that individual. Uh, generally, if you have a strong and a sustained, a strong and a sustained uh, stimulus, okay, so you can uh, manifest both the vomiting or the, the motion sickness, and also it will uh, in, uh, induce the brain to store these neural inputs. But if it's, it's if it's a weak uh, mismatch, if there's a weak mismatch, what can happen is that you may not have uh, motion sickness. Uh, what the brain will do is that it will learn to adapt and it will store these information without uh, manifesting. Now, what are the kind of mismatches we have? We have two kind of mismatch. One is the visual vestibular, and the other is intravestibular. Intravestibular is between the uh, mismatch between the inputs from the canals and the otolytic organs. Now, let's see in this first situation. Uh, this we, had, we will we have three conditions, three types of situations where we have in the visual uh, vestibular mismatch and the. Uh, uh, canal autolytic mismatch. Now when, let's have a look at the first type of mismatch. This occurs when we sit in a vehicle, we're looking outside, so we see that there's a, there's a visual input where the, where the environment is moving, and at the same time we're sitting in a vehicle where it's taking turns, and, and, and the vehicle is traveling at different speed and taking different uh, turns. So you have uh, your vestibular inputs and you have a uh, visual inputs. So these both these inputs are happening simultaneously, but they are not in harmony with each other. So if it's not a learned, uh, not a learned or a habituated response yet for the individual, he will manifest himself, uh, itself as a motion sickness. So what are the other kind of situation where we have? We have in the VR one of the VRT where you have a boat right, right? You have a boat which is going and it's you know is uh, is going through bumpy surfaces and you if you look at the sites, your other the, the environment is also moving. So one of the uh, thing is you have it in the VRT, which will be helpful probably in in the future uh, in the future in the, in the next slide as we come to, towards the treatment. And also it happens, all, uh, all of us who are wearing specs, we see that when we wear new specs, there may be some change in the axis. So that have, we have, we, we get a, a slight, uh, for some time, we feel uncomfortable because uh, the, the vision is disturbed. So these also, you, this is, these all fall in the type one uh, mismatch. The type two mismatch, see, you can have simultaneous inputs coming from both the vision, the visual and the vestibular. And in the type two is when you have either only the visual cues without the vestibular cue, or, or the uh, vestibular cues without the um, visual cues happening. So in type type two, we have the two uh, two A and two B. In the two type two A is when you have a vest uh, visual inputs. Say like you're sitting in a in a simulator, okay, in a driving simulator, or especially though these people who are in the space uh, space program, they sit in a simulator. Or you also can uh, experience this when you're sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a hall with a big screen. If anyone has been to uh, one of the science cities uh, where they have a big, huge screen and you sit and you see that uh, you see the, uh, f the, you know, the, mm, the person from going in his glider, uh, gliders and it's very vertiginous, okay? So these, these when you have visual input but you're, you're, not, you're not having any vis uh, your vestibular cues. So this type of motion sickness is uh, club in that type two uh, a, mm. and now you also get what you do when you're reading. When you're reading or you're, you're watching a video and while sitting in a vehicle, your visual your visual cues is is limited to to the, to your what whatever you're doing. It's static, but at the same time your vehicle is moving and you're having a lot of uh, inputs coming from the from the ears. And if you're not habituated, you you get again the motion sickness. Okay, and this, this is club on a type two, or in some, some literature it says the type three mismatch. Now, so you have these three kind of uh, mismatch when you, uh, when, uh, in the, mm, when you have a mismatch on the vestibular, uh, visual vestibular uh, type. Now, let's see what are the kinds of uh, mismatch when you have a uh, intravestibular. Intravestibular means when they have your autolith and your uh, semicircular canal mismatch. So this happens, you see again, we have a, a program, the VRT, who has taken a car drive, you know, you're going, 
turn, taking a turn. So what happens when you're taking a turn is that your, your body is moving, your head is moving as well. So what happens is that when, uh, that is in tune. When your car is moving, your body is moving, you're taking a turn. But what happens is that when, you're, 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 when your body is rotating and then suddenly you make your head, you move your head or you turn this way. So your, uh, your, your canal is signaling some, something else and your autolytic organ is, is uh, signaling something else. So that mismatch uh, you get in what we club with as a type 1 intervestibular mismatch. <coughs> now, that is when, in the type 1 is when you have simultaneous inputs, but there are times when you have only uh, inputs coming from, this, uh, from the semicircular canal or from the, from the autolytic organ. So these are club as type 2 and type 3 or type 2A or type 2B. In type 2A, it's just like when you're doing caloric test or, uh, or alcoholic nystagmus where you have a heavy, heavy copula or in space uh, motion program where you have a lot of inputs where you have inputs coming only from the, from the semicircular canal. And uh, in space program is generally because of the, uh, uh, in, a, in a micro gravity condition where, you'd, uh, where you're probably detecting only your, your, uh, your role and your pitch or whatever, uh, like what uh, Dr. Sujit had just mentioned just now. So your vestibular, uh, vestibular is sending a lot of signal, but your, uh, your, uh, your autolytic organ is not sending any signal. So there's a mismatch in that, and we get a type 2 kind of uh, condition. And in, now this is a type 3. This happens when you have an autolytic uh, organ signaling but not the vestibule uh, vestibules, uh, giving any signals. That is generally when you are in an off vertical, either in a horizontal roll or in a vertical, uh, in an off vertical where generally the signals are sent, uh, the, the motion is, is, uh, is uh, 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 sensed only by the autolytic organs. Now coming to the tolerance of motion sickness, there's a wide range of tolerance in the motion sickness. Why uh, and why this we will see, and we get the peak at uh, two to uh, twelve years of age, which is generally rare after uh, fifty years of age, and females are more susceptible, especially those in, uh, during pregnancy and menstruation, which uh, which they have hypothesized that hormonal hormones can play a role in in the development of um, uh, motion sickness. The physical conditions. Emotional state. Now, emotional state is very interesting. As I told you, I, I was a victim of this. And you know what? Uh, before traveling, even hours before traveling, you would get that smell of the exhaust. It's just, it's just, it's there in the brain. It just have. So, and when you get that, you know, uh, and I've asked this, uh, that the many, many who have this uh, severe motion sickness, even before traveling, even that they know that uh, an hour before traveling, they get a notion that, no, I'm going to have that. Uh, so the emotional state of a person do play an important role in, uh, devel uh, in, the, in the development of uh, motion sickness. And it's seen that introverts have more uh, motion sickness than uh, the, the extroverts. Now, why is this wide range of susceptibility? The, this has been explained by these two uh, phenomena, there's receptibility and, ex uh, and the adaptability. High receptibility and low receptibility where in a, in, in, uh, when you have a high receptibility, you have a high in, uh, uh, chance of having this mismatch happening in you. So when you have high receptibility, that means you have high chance of having motion sickness. And then adaptability. Adaptability is that there, there are people who adapt very fast and people who adapt very slow. Who adapt very fast, they will not develop uh, motion sickness, but those who adapt to take longer time to adapt, they will suffer more from motion sickness. Therefore, uh, high recep uh, receptibility, uh, receptivity and slow adapt uh, adaptability, they will suffer. These person who have such a, such a state will have more uh, chance of having uh, motion sickness. Coming to the prevention and the treatment. So we, there are the three approaches to this. One is the behavioral uh, measures, adaptation, and the drug management. Uh, behavioral is that uh, you, there are a few steps which you can take as a behavioral measures. That is, uh, you, restrict, uh, um, uh, you restrict your head movement, head immobilization. So that when there's a sway, your whole body sway together, there's less mismatch between your, uh, your canals and the autolith, uh, autolith. You also try to see, give the visual cues, get the visual cues. So that way you, you, you have inputs coming from your, your eyes and your, and your vestibule also. Uh, avoid 
alcohol because they aff uh, they affect your visual suppression and smoking has also seen to affect uh, uh, motion sickness sleeping it suppresses the excitability of the vestibule so it does help um, in reducing uh, your motion sickness having a controlled breathing and keeping yourself engaged in some activities so the moment the you, the lesser you concentrate on what the movement is happening the lesser you you have the tendency to develop motion sickness so you, so you keep yourself busy in the environment so that's why when we travel with kids we keep them telling stories and keep them engaged so that they keep chatting they keep uh, they keep their brains engaged and they, they're not concentrating on on one on the on a motion so that will that do help and uh, for those who are in space uh, space uh, program they are subjected to what is known as ground based desensitization they they they, get, uh, they make them uh, get habituated to these kind of uh, movements uh, adaptation and i see what the vrt will, will be really helpful in managing uh, managing the uh, motion sickness uh, you have the board right and you have the that car right which is which to me looks really fantastic in uh, in trying to get one habituated to these uh, and uh, not the less drug treatment drug treatment uh, it has been the first mention of drug treatment is in 1876 in uh, 1869 in uh, in uh, published in lancet as a letter to editor there he mentioned the use of chloroform and tincture of uh, belladonna but then now when you're giving a treatment you should consider certain uh, things like the susceptibility and the type and the magnitude of motion sickness and whether you want to prevent motion sickness or to uh, treat when the motion sickness has uh, the symptoms have uh, uh, happened so there, there are few drugs which we give uh, scopolamine we not we do not get it diamond hydronate we generally is very difficult uh, uh, to get these so the only drug which is available with us in our scenario is promethazine so promethazine we have two types of uh, two two preparation ones are uh, uh, promethazine hydrochloride which we all know as phenergan and thioclate from uh, promethazine thioclate which we know as uh, avomin so yeah, that again uh, they it depends the pediatrician likes to give uh, phenergan and uh, for me personally uh, whoever have thing i, I like uh, th uh, the avomin uh, that's promethazine thioclate. So that's again an individual, but again, it's it's the same uh, property. Uh, that again, uh, and these generally these drugs are given about uh, an hour before uh, traveling, and uh, they last for uh, the act, uh, the active action of the drug lasts for about 12 hours, eight to 12 hours. So it's longer duration of action, um, but. Uh, and if you and if if the person has already suffered from motion sickness probably the other drug you can give is metoclopramide that's a uh, metoclopramide or stematil do act also uh, there are a lot of other drugs which have been mentioned and uh, these uh, anticholinergic the, and uh, the other antihistamines but the, the problem is the availability so we all i think that uh, we all agree that we all stick to generally uh, these uh, part only one drug only does promethazines which is easily available everywhere uh, with that, I would like to thank you.